Hello, so I'm making these four videos for anyone who's considering making the transition between year 11 and A-level chemistry. If you're thinking about doing A-level chemistry or if you've made up your mind to do A-level chemistry, you need to make sure that you understand everything that I'm gonna say in these four videos. And I've chosen these topics because in a lot of cases I see year 11s coming into year 12, they've done their GCSEs and done well, but there's some aspects that they haven't understood well enough and we build on those massively in year 12. So it'd be very useful if you start your course in September to have a good deep understanding of these things I'm going to talk about. Obviously the more you know about chemistry the better you'll do in chemistry so let's get into it. This one's all about using the periodic table and I go through a bunch of things. I'm going to start with isotopes and relative atomic mass. Then I'm going to do atomic structure and the Bohr model of electron structure. Then I'm going to use the periodic table to determine the formulae of some ionic compounds and there's a bunch of common ions which you need to just know off by heart so I'll tell you those as well. And then quickly at the end, there'll be a bit on calculating relative molecular mass and relative formula mass. And we'll start with isotopes. Isotopes are atoms of an element which have the same number of protons and electrons, but a different number of neutrons. And I've put an example here, chlorine 37 and chlorine 35. Now, both of these have each got 17 protons and 17 electrons, but chlorine 37 has got 20 neutrons and chlorine 35 has got 18 neutrons. And if you look at the periodic table, you'll notice that it's neither 35 nor 37, which is on the periodic table. Normally on the periodic table, it says 35.5. And that number comes from the fact that neither of these is the only type of chlorine. It's about 75% chlorine 35 and about 25% chlorine 37. And it's this 25% 37 and 75% 35, which gives us the number which is on the periodic table. So if you just do 25% of 37, plus 75% of 35, that gives you the relative atomic mass, which is a weighted mean mass, and that is 35.5. Okay, so that's the basics of isotopes, but I've used the words protons, electrons, neutrons, and they come from atomic structure, so that's what we'll do next. Okay, so the basic atomic structure, the nuclear model, is you have the nucleus at the middle with protons and neutrons in it, and then the electrons orbit the nucleus. And in GCSE, you learn an extension to this. It's called the Bohr model, and you learn that the electrons aren't just at one distance away from the nucleus, they can exist at different energy levels, which you call shells. And so you learn this structure, where you could have two electrons on the first shell, eight electrons on the next shell, and then you probably learn that there's eight electrons on the shell after that. Now at A level, you learn an extension to this model, where it's made even more complicated. But the Bohr model is useful. This is the Bohr model. And it's useful because it tells us about the different shells and the different periods of the periodic table. So the first period of the periodic table, if you look at it, has two elements. Those are the two electrons here. The next period has eight elements. The period after that has eight elements as well. And so the periodic table is the shape that it is because the electrons in the atom are in this arrangement. And knowing about this arrangement, and how many electrons there are in each of the shells helps you with bonding and structure. So structure is if it's simple or giant, bonding is if it's covalent, metallic, or ionic. So this would be an atom of a noble gas. And the reason you know that that's a noble gas because it's got eight electrons in its outer shell. And the whole full outer shell is stable. It's not a complete model, but it's pretty good and it'll do for now. It's got eight electrons already, therefore it's stable, and therefore it doesn't do reaction. It doesn't commonly make ions. So this would be argon. If I took away an electron, so it had 17 electrons, that's now chlorine. And chlorine is a halogen, and like other halogens, it wants to gain one electron. And it wants to gain one electron because it has seven, and eight is a full outer shell, and a full outer shell is happy. And so elements in group seven, the halogens, tend to make one minus ions by gaining one electron. That's in ionic bonds, obviously. If they're doing covalent bonds, then they make one bond instead of making a one minus charge. If I take away another electron, this would now be sulfur, which is in group six. To make it have a happy outer shell, then it gains two electrons. So that would be a two minus charge in an ionic compound and two bonds if it's bonding covalently. If I take away another one, you get phosphorus, which is in group five. Group five things, if they make ionic compounds, they make a three minus charge, and in covalent compounds, they make three bonds. Now, if I take away another one, you end up with silicon, and silicon, we get to that area of semi-metals, where everything gets a little bit strange, metalloids, we don't really talk about those at GCSE, we don't need to know all that much about them, just that they tend to make four covalent bonds. If I take away another one, you get aluminium, 
Group three, it's a metal, so it loses three electrons this time. Because it's easier, in my mind, it makes sense to lose three electrons here than to gain five. So losing three electrons makes aluminium a three plus ion when it does ionic bonding. Then next is magnesium, which makes two plus ions, then sodium, which makes one plus ions, and then you get to neon, which has got a full outer shell again, and so is stable. And so from the position on the periodic table, specifically the group that an element is in, you can work out what ionic charge it will have in an ionic compound. And that's useful for what I'm going to do next, which is determining the formulae of ionic compounds. And the first thing to note is that all compounds are electrically neutral overall, which means that the positive charges and the negative charges have to cancel out in ionic compounds. So you have to have the same number of pluses as you have minuses. And that is the basis on which you do all ionic compounds. So you need to know the charge of the positive ion, the cation. You need to know the charge of the negative anion. And once you know that, you know how many of each you need to make it balance out so that they're the same. And how you know the charges is based partly on the periodic table. And then there's a few which I'll tell you now. Now, a lot of these are complex ions, as in they contain more than one atom in the ion. If it's just one atom, normally you can look at the periodic table, see what group it's in, and then know what the charge is on the ion. Um, the only ones that are here that are atoms are ones in the transition elements, the D block, and so it's difficult to tell what their charge is. Normally they'll tell you, but with zinc and silver, you can assume that zinc is always 2 plus and silver is always 1 plus if it's making an ion. The complex ions are nitrate 5, so it's got a 1 minus charge, NO3 minus, carbonate, which is CO3 2 minus, then sulfate 6 is SO4 2 minus, and hydroxide, which is OH minus. Those are ones which is good to just know. A lot of them you can remember from knowing the acids, that's how I do it. So HNO3, H is 1 plus, and so NO3 must be 1 minus, and H2SO4, so sulfuric acid is H2SO4, means 2 H pluses, therefore it's 2 minus. And then the one that's left is this cationic complex ion, this is an ammonium ion, and it's NH4 plus. So given this information and the information from the periodic table in terms of groups, you can work out the ionic formula of most ionic compounds. So I'll just give you some examples. Aluminium chloride. Aluminium's in group three, so it makes three plus ions. Chloride, group seven, so it makes one minus ions. The ionic formula would be AlCl3. So you can see the plus charges balance with the negative charges. It's three plus and then there's three minus, which makes it electrically neutral overall. And I've given a few more examples. So magnesium oxide, so Mg2 plus and O2 minus, balance out, so you just need one of each. The sodium oxide, you need two sodiums for every oxide. And then lithium nitride would be Li3N. Look at the periodic table if you want to know where these numbers come from. You could also do the same thing using these complex ions. So if we had, for instance, sodium sulfate, sodium is one plus because it's in group one, sulfate is two minus, so that would be Na2SO4. And if you're doing, for instance, aluminium hydroxide, aluminium is 3 plus because it's in group 3. Hydroxide is 1 minus, so you need 3 hydroxides. Now, the way that you show that in the formula is by doing brackets 3, so 3 hydroxide ions. And so it looks like this. Now, the last thing I said I was going to talk about is calculating relative molecular mass and relative formula mass. The difference there is that relative molecular mass is for molecules, so simple covalent substances, and relative formula mass is for things like ionic compounds. So let's work out the relative formula mass of aluminium hydroxide. You need to know the masses of each of the elements. So aluminium is 27, I believe. Oxygen is 16 and hydrogen is one. So you'd need 27 and then three lots of 16 and one, which gives you a relative formula mass of 78, which of course means that one mole weighs 78 grams, but we'll go over moles in a later video. Okay, that's everything for using the periodic table. Make sure you know how to use the periodic table to work out the charges on ions or the number of covalent bonds that an atom will make. And also, if you learn as many of these anions and cations as possible, then you'll do yourself justice when it comes to answering questions in A-level papers. A-level chemistry is difficult, the questions are difficult, and getting each mark is difficult. You don't want to lose those marks on something you could easily have learned, such as the formulae of some common ions. Okay, thank you for watching. Hopefully you've learned something about A-level chemistry. I'll see you in the next one.